center of worship. As you <clears throat> probably know by now, we are emphasizing the theme of Christian service. And uh, this, uh, for all of you who are in a voluntary role, uh, we want to express our appreciation to you. Um, Bud mentioned a few of the areas in which you're serving, the nursery, hospitality, finances, all band members, you do bulletins, you're a greeter or an usher, teacher, you do PowerPoint, you clean or repair or landscape, if you feel the bad history or empty it, if you do vacation Bible school or children's church, well, you get the picture. If you're in uh, any voluntary position here at the church, we want to express our appreciation to you. I want to thank you. And um, to, uh, not just with my words, but with my deeds. And so this Thursday, if uh, any of these, you fill any of these roles, uh, you and your spouse, your spouse is welcome as well. Now, he, he or she may not do anything, but they are blessed because you are blessed. We're going to bless you. We're going to invite you to a free dinner at Ruggiero's, and I assure you it will be all you can eat. It'll be at 6 30, no agenda, just a meal. Wonderful meal on us. So I hope you can come and fellowship. The only uh, caveat is we need you to let us know because I have to turn in a final count tomorrow. So please, if we don't have your name down, make sure your name is down. And if you're not sure about it, then just I'm going to be out here taking names. So just turn by and say it's my name only. In keeping with the theme of uh, Christian service, I want to turn you this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. And I want to, I want to introduce you to a faithful servant. Named Emily. Uh, First Samuel chapter twenty-one. Our key verse is verse six, but I'm going to read verses one through six. First Samuel twenty-one verse one. David came to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came to meet David trembling and said, "Why are you alone and no one with you?" David said, The king has charged me with a matter, and he said, Let no one know anything of the matter of which I send you, with which I have charged you. And uh, by the way, I, I'm guessing David is kind of fudging a little bit because uh, Saul, who was the king, has actually tried to kill David. So I doubt if he's on a mission for the king, at least that king. Verse 4, the priest said to David, I have no, uh, verse 3, now, then what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you would have here. Verse 4, the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. And if the young men have kept themselves from women, and David said, Oh yes, truly the women have been kept as always when I go on expedition, and their vessels are holy, even in our, on an ordinary journey. So how much more today? Verse 6, a key verse. So the priest, that is a hymn gave him, David, the holy bread, for there was no bread that, but the bread of the presence, the bread of God's fellowship, which is removed 
before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the Sabbath day. Some background might be helpful. <clears throat> the children of Israel have come out of Egyptian bondage. It's a good place to start. They have wandered for 40 years. The book of Judges talks about several leaders that have arisen and come and gone. They have now come to a point in the first century where they want a king so they'll be like other nations. And they saw the first king of Israel. But Saul was a madman especially toward the end. And in, in a few chapters earlier, 1 Samuel 16, 12, God told Samuel the prophet to go to a man's house named Jesse in Bethlehem. And there God would tell Samuel who the true king of Israel should be. So he went. Samuel went to Jesse's household. Jesse Samuel said, bring in all your sons. So he brought in all, all of them, about seven or eight of them, except for one. He was the youngest. He was king of the king And as Samuel looked over these men, not one of them did God say yes to. And Samuel was a little confused. And he said, is there, is there any others? Do you have any other sons? And Jesse said, yeah, I have one more, but he keeps sheep. He's the youngest. He's out in the fields and said, well, bring him in. So he did. And in comes little David, which earlier, by the way, in chapter 17, has killed Goliath. So now he's back to keeping sheep. But David has is standing there and God says to Samuel, anoint him, for he is the next king. Now he has a future, but not a title. Saul has a title, but not a future. David has God's promise and prediction and the anointing. And so David then in after he's anointed as the future king, goes back to keeping sheep. You know, when God makes a promise, then you can rest on it. He'll bring it to pass. So when he goes back to keeping sheep, Saul knows he's killed Goliath, he's popular with the people, and Saul decides to kill David. So David is now running for his life. He's got a few men with him. He's a fugitive from the king's army. He's unable now in 1 Samuel 21 to farm or shepherd sheep or have any kind of income or provision. So he's rummaging. He's scavenging and running around the countryside looking for food. He decides to go to church. He says, I'm looking, I'm scavenging for food. I should go to the tabernacle. I should go to the high priest in the city of God, which is where, which is a priestly city. Now there's a, the next chapter says there were about eight, there were about 85 priests and then their wives, so 160, 170, and then they had children. So there was around 300 people in the city of priests. So David goes there. And in verse 3, he asks Ahimelech, he said, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread. And Ahimelech, the priest, says, verse 4, I have no bread, common bread, except for holy bread. Now I want to point out something here about uh, this uh, 
holy bread. Leviticus 24, starting in verse 5, says that you're to take fine flour and bake 12 loaves from it and set them in two piles or rows, six in each one, on a table of pure gold before the Lord as a food offering to the Lord every Sabbath day, Leviticus 24, verse 8, Aaron is to arrange it before the Lord. So, give me the picture of this table. This would be sometimes called the table of showbread or the table of God's presence. And it was inside the tabernacle, just in front of the Holy of Holies. And what it symbolized was it was a food offering to God. There were 12 of these cakes from each of the 12, one from each of the 12 tribes. And what it symbolized was God is at the table and Israel, all 12 tribes, is his family. And they're eating together. And they have brought this to the Lord. It is part of a, the sim, symbolism of the tabernacle to show God's fellowship with His people. And it was the job of the high priest to make sure that that stayed on the table until each Sabbath day in which it was exchanged for fresh bread. Since Adam, whom God told he could, him and Eve, could eat of anything in the Garden of Eden except the one tree. And since he ate of what was forbidden, he was exiled from the Garden of Eden. But God has been inviting men back to eat. I, it's an amazing thing. The offerings in the sacrificial system of, of the Old Testament are called food offerings. And they are brought to God. And you are, if you brought an offering, uh, most of the offerings, you ate part of the offering before the Lord. We have communion service. That it's communion with who? With God. Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, was accused of eating with tax collectors and sinners. God is always wanting to invite us back in to eat to fellowship with Him, to be joyful in His presence. And so, this is one of the main themes of the Old Testament. That's why I love having uh, uh, these big meals that we have here at the church on occasion. And we're going to have another one before too long. But, uh, this is the theme. So, to keep that theme of eating with God, they he had a table. It was so valuable a thing that he made it pure gold to show its value. And the priest was to keep that before God daily. Now, if you'll notice, the priest did not have enough bread to eat for himself. Verse 4 again. I have no common bread, but there's holy bread. The, the state of God's people and the worship during Saul's day had just collapsed into disrepair. And the priesthood and the Levites, the priestly tribe, were neglected. See, people didn't bring sacrifices, so the priest had no food. They had no provision or farmland with which to sow seed and to reap a harvest and have bread. So all they had left was one serving enough to go on the table before God. He could give it to God or he could keep it for himself. And the priest, Deuteronomy 1427 says, you are not to neglect the Levite within your town because he has no inheritance in the land. They were to be supported. But during Saul's reign, 
the priesthood was completely neglected to the point that they didn't even have bread except the bread that they could put on the golden table. When David wanted to worship, Saul had died and he was made the king. He was going to bring the ark back. No one even knew where it was. Psalm 132 verse 6 says, David writes, We had heard of it in Ephratah, a village in Israel. We found it in the fields of Jair. The Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, where God promised to speak to His people. And that was to be in the center of the tabernacle. By the end of David's reign, it had been so neglected, people didn't even know where it was. David said, I heard of it. And I found it in a field of Jaguar. And then he says, Oh, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. And you'll find that one of the things that can happen is a nation can go into such a decline. Churches can be so neglected that they become the equivalent of a pagan nation having been clearly Christian. And an example of that today is Great Britain, the United Kingdom, which used to be a clear-cut Christian nation in the 1940s. The churches were full as they prayed for their soldiers fighting Nazi Germany. Today, 1% to 2% of the people attend church. And it has become overrun with other religions and paganism and atheism in Great Britain today. So when, when David saw this, he said, I'm going to look for it, and he found it. But now that was later. Now, in his early life, being hunted by Saul, being a fugitive from his kingdom, David is now starving. David is hungry. And so he decides to go to the church. He decides to go to the tabernacle and go to the priest. Now notice, here's the decision of faith that I want you to see. Verse 6, our text. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of God's presence, the fellowship, the symbol of God's presence, eating with him. There was no other bread. So what did the priest do? He gave him, David, the bread from off the table. Now, Himalayan made two decisions of faith. One decision of faith was when he had bread. Now, you got to think about this. He had enough to bake, isn't that interesting, 12 loaves. And Himalayan could have thought, well, look, I've got to eat. Or he could have thought, I've got to serve. I've got to do my duty, and I've got to act in faith. Then I know what God said, so that's what I'm going to do. He could have said, Look, nobody cares. It's the, it's the tabernacle. Nobody brings sacrifices. Nobody gives to us. There's no support here. I'm, besides, I live in Nob. Who cares? My life is insignificant. He could have said that. If nobody else cares, why should I? Texas, there was a, a, a man there who had 
dedicated his life to the Lord. His, his wife was committed uh, to the Lord. I always remember that she had one of those hairdos, you know, uh, that where it circles around on top of your head. It was high up. I remember that. I don't know how spiritual she was, but her hair looked holy. That's all I know. And he had decided that God had called him to preach. And this was in Texas. And a church in Arkansas actually issued a call to him to come pastor their church. So he loaded everything up in his truck and you haul it. And him and his wife and kids drove down to Arkansas. And they pulled up to the parsonage. And I had heard about this uh, later because after he had left, I never I thought I'd never seen him again. But two or three days later, they were all back. And I said, what happened? He said, well, I got there, pulled into the driveway of the parsonage. Not one person was there to help me unpack. So I just turned around and came back to Texas. Huh, can you do that? <laughs> if God calls you, can you do that? No. His attitude was, if nobody else cares, why should I? Ahimelech could have embraced that philosophy of life, but he didn't. He could have said, well, who's going to actually eat this bread? Nobody's ever seen God eat it. <laughs> A lot of things he could have said. But what he did say was, Lord, here is my last pieces of bread. I am going to use it for worship and service to God. So people serve or give to God. It's not because they have extra time or extra money. There's so many things people could do with their time and money rather than give it to God. But like a Himalayan, they choose to serve God with what they have left. It, this is all I've got. I give it to God. Let me point something else out that I impressed me about him. The priest gave him, David, the holy bread, for there was no bread but that. At the end of seven days, the priest took, according to the law, took the old bread off the table and put fresh bread on it. That's in Leviticus 24, verse 89. And guess what you could do with the old bread? Who could have the bread when you take it off the table to replenish it with the new? Here's what Leviticus 24 8 says. Every Sabbath day, Aaron, that's the high priest, will arrange it before the Lord. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons. And they shall eat it in the holy place. Since it is for him a most holy portion from the Lord's offering of perpetual duty. It is for him. Now here, Ahimelech is now the high priest. The bread was for him. He could legitimately eat it. But he didn't. He gave it to David. I just find this man impressive on so, in so many ways. It may be that Ahimelech knew David was God's anointing because of Samuel the prophet in the previous chapter. But it was the faith that has impressed him. He took what was his own, even what was his due, and he worshipped God and supported God's future king. Now a lot of people in the Old Testament gave to the king after he became king. 
they would give to the king after a great victory. Notice that Ahimelech gave to this king when he was rejected by men, pursued by Saul, and persecuted by many in the Jewish army. Jesus compares himself to David, and this event in Matthew chapter 12, verse 2, when Jesus and his disciples were plucking corn on the Sabbath day and evening. And the Pharisees said, Aha! Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Now what those Pharisees were doing out in a cornfield, I don't know. But for some reason, Jesus and his disciples walk along in this cornfield and they decide to pluck some corn, it's on the Sabbath, and all of a sudden, some Pharisees jump up, divide the stalks, and say, Aha! Gotcha! And they said, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he, and he Jesus, said to them, this is Matthew 12, 2, Haven't you read what David did when he was hungry and those with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence. He's comparing himself to David. And he says, the idea is just as David was the true king, though rejected by men and persecuted by all, you couldn't recognize him by his accompaniments, his retinue. By all, you couldn't recognize him by his environment because he was poverty-stricken and starving. Jesus said, in the same way, I and my men, we are rejected, we are persecuted, but the future is ours. And that's what Jesus compares himself to. And, and in fact, when Ahimelech gave David the bread, thus causing him to live and survive and become the king later, in David at that moment, was all his angels, all his, his descendants. Jesus was a descendant of David. And he was supporting the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Himalayan didn't know that. Three quick comments now on this story. One is this. We often serve without realizing how much good we are doing. Ahimelech gave to David not realizing. Man, I know he's going to be the king. I mean, I, I think that's, I think Ahimelech knew that. But what a king he would become. Under David's kingship, the land of Israel expanded to its furthest borders. Israel went all the way to Iraq, modern day Iraq, and the river Euphrates and the baby. The largest expansion never was that big again. David never lost a battle. David wrote the Psalms. Oh, and Ahimelech was supporting that kingship. He didn't realize what a great, mighty thing he was doing. He knew he'd be the king, but what a king. This is our service to Jesus. We know we're doing something significant, even eternal, but we have no idea how vast and majestic a thing this is. It is the kingdom of God that is eternal and will never pass away. That's why we serve. We don't realize sometimes how much our service matters. Like a Himalayan. Another thing is, we often need to just ignore the lowest state of the faith in the Christian church today. Christians are mocked and ridiculed. Churches are neglected and ignored. 
But I want to say to you today that Jesus is still the Messiah. He's still the Lord of lords and King of kings. And He shall rule over this earth. And He shall rule with all nations bowing before Him. And we give because Jesus and His people have a future. And presidents and prime ministers today, their titles are nothing. They pass away. But we need to look beyond, have a vision of the future that includes the full kingdom of God. We had a guy in high school. I played basketball, by the way, in high school. They call me Red Hot Red Mouth. <laughs> I can't help it. That's what they said. I didn't say. But we had a singer, a C E N T R, not T E R. Not yes, I am. <laughs> the sin, our singer was named Joe. He was a big gambling guy, and you. Okay, he's a. He was big and ugly and awkward and bumping into things and tall. He just seemed like a misfit. Until we were on the basketball court. And all of a sudden, he fit. He was beautiful. He had a jump shot just getting the ball. And in this world, we as Christians, we seem gangly and ugly and awkward. And people laugh at us. But the environment doesn't fit us yet. We're being made for another environment. And when we get there, people will say, oh, that's what he's made for. He fits that environment. Can I get a witness? Can I get an amen today? Amen. Servants of the Lord, you'll fit when the kingdom arrives in the schools. Let me give you one final point. You may not know this, you may not count on it or think about it, but God will reward faithful service. He will not be in debt to you. Proverbs 11, 31 says, Behold, the righteous will be uh, recompensed in the earth. They will have compensation. Where? In the earth. In the earth. What was Ahimelech's compensation? And I was thinking about this. You know, all of us have children or grandchildren. If there's one thing we would want as a reward, it's for our children and grandchildren to be blessed. Amen? That God would save our children and grandchildren. That's the one thing we would want. 1 Samuel 22 says that after Saul came in and killed all the people in Nob, guess what? Ahimelech had a son named Abiathar. And out of 300 people, he escaped. And since he's the son of a high priest, he could become the high priest. He became the high priest of David. You find that in 1 Samuel 22, in verses 18 through 23. David says to Abiathar, who had escaped the massacre, he says, you stay with me, verse 23. Don't be afraid, for Saul seeks my life and seeks yours. With me, you will be saved. God saved His Son. I was looking at some verses. Compensation to the children and grandchildren. Psalm 102, verse 28. Put that one up. What a great verse. The children of your servants will dwell secure and their offspring will be established. Do you know that Abiathar, the son of the Himalayan, 
became the high priest of David for 40 years. He was the high priest during the kingdom's height of glory. Next verse. Give me the next one. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and greatly delights in his commands. His offspring will be mighty in the land. And that's what happened to his son. He became mighty in the land. And then the third one. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. And his children will find a refuge. But you know, Himelech's son found a refuge in David. You serve God. I want you to know God sees it. He will reward you. There is compensation in this earth. And you can pray and you can trust God and ask Him, Lord, whether it's in my lifetime or not, let my children, let my grandchildren find a refuge in You. Let them be saved in Your presence. Let us serve God because there's a way. Bow with me for, for prayer and ushers. If you will get ready, let's worship with our youth today. Heavenly Father, as we bow in Your presence, We come not with a lot of rules of breaking. Most of us have little to give. Help us, I pray today, to follow a hymn and give it in faith, serving in faith that we are serving the true King who has a vision and a kingdom yet to we will so be happy to that environment. Born for. Bless those who give. Bless those who serve. Bless those who pray. Help us to serve you with all our heart in Jesus' name. Amen.